Mr. Kaiser is, I think, especially well suited to have written this book, but even more so um, to speak to us uh, at SSB. He spent uh, three decades in the CIA's uh, Director of Intelligence, um, where he also taught at the Sherman Kent School of Intelligence Analysis. He was the editor of several um, Director of Intelligence uh, publications. And he has, I think, a really unique educational background that would have been a different era would have situated you perfectly to, 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 um, to be an SSP student. He has a, a Bachelor's of Science in Mining Engineering from Virginia Poly. Um, he has a Master of Science in Operations Research and Management uh, from George Mason. And then just around that out, he has a Master of Arts in European History from Catholic. So this is someone who has thought a lot about researching, writing, analysis, but especially communications. And we're really delighted and honored to have you here. So thank you. Thanks, Dave. I mean, you've kind of brought back a bad memory in a way. I can remember when I told my dad that I had this very lucrative mining engineering degree and that I was going to go back to school and study European history. <laughs> he about fell off the chair. And that's probably putting it mildly. Uh, by way of introduction uh, and giving you a sense of who I am, I'd just like to add a couple of things. One, I'm married and the father of, of two adult children. I am um, also teach uh, catechism to kindergartners, which has just been a blast. It's been so much fun. And then uh, the other couple things I'd like to mention is uh, I love golden retrievers. I am a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Anybody here a Steelers fan? And I'm a fantasy. Are you? Yeah, this was a, that was a tough loss against Baltimore. And I am a uh, fantasy baseball addict. <coughs> well, well, let me go ahead and get started. And the first thing I'd like to mention is, you know, there are two main components of good writing. And I think you sort of, you probably already know what they are. But, you know, one is good organization, and the other is good sentence construction. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those issues today. Uh, one of the things that has made the biggest difference in improving my own writing has been learning how to put myself in the shoes of the reader when I review my own drafts. Uh, if I could emphasize one idea that would be the main takeaway of my talk today, that would be it. Learn how to look at your drafts from the perspective of the reader. Uh, a lot of good writing habits are really driven, and I would argue maybe, you know, maybe most of them, possibly all of them, from that one perspective. When I was a, uh, a teacher at CIA's Sherman Kent School, and I was reviewing a paper with a student, and um, I would note that, you know, that sentence there wasn't all that clear, or that information here probably could have worked a little better in another part of the paper. Often what I got in terms of a response was, well, you know, I, I sort of said that. You know, and it's already in the paper there. Well, from the reader's perspective, just being in the paper somewhere, in some form, is, is not a good benchmark for, for good writing. But a lot of people have that benchmark. Um, <clears throat> one of the best ways, and really, and it's not exactly a hard way either, to learn how to put yourself in the reader's perspective, is to read what other people have written critically from a writing perspective. And that could be almost anything. That can be an internet story. That can be a newspaper account. That can be an email. Uh, it could be your roommate's paper. And as you're going through this process, ask yourself, you know, what is it that you're finding confusing? What is it that needs clarification? What is it that needs to have its relevance explained? And what is it that really didn't provide a lot of value added? And, and could have been deleted. Um, a 
Okay. This, this writing analysis and those questions, and particularly, you know, your answers or your solutions to fixing those writing problems, uh, they'll become self-teaching points for you. They'll become part of your writing repertoire or your writing consciousness, and you'll use them in your own writing. Now here is an example of what I'm talking about. I hope I do this right. Okay. Here is a sentence. Okay. It was written by an attorney. And it's a gra grammatically correct sentence. But the reader really has to process a lot of information. <coughs> Remember and process a lot of introductory information before without any basis to evaluate that information. Now, I'm sure the, the attorney, for, before he sent out that email, reread that email. And I'm almost certain that when he reread re -read that sentence, that sentence was grammatically correct to him and it didn't pose any major problem. And the reason for that is he knew where he was going with that sentence. He knew what the point was, so it all read pretty well. Now, if I can make a small point here, in addition to the larger point of learn how to put yourself in the reader's perspective when you look at your own papers, it would be, I wouldn't start a sentence with a long introductory phrase that goes on for three and a half lines. Um, and that's different than a clause, because clauses will have a subject and a verb. But most of the time, you know, these, a phrase will not have a subject or a verb. As a general point, I would emphasize that you try to get your subject and your verb as close to the start of the sentence as possible. Okay? Um, one of the questions to ask yourself is, you know, how readable is my writing. You know, and there's, there's truly a spectrum there, and it's pretty broad. And I'm at one end of the spectrum, and unfortunately, you know, some people are, are kind of at that end of the spectrum. The writer has to read it, reread it, ponder what was being said, and then they may get it. Now, the ideal, the other end of the spectrum, is the reader reads it once, and gets it all. Okay. Now, at some point in your career, you're going to be writing for a busy audience, you know, a busy reader who most of the time will not have a lot of tolerance or patience for confusion and digression. Your writing is going to have to be as efficient and as transparent as possible. So what do I mean by efficient and transparent? What I mean is writing that moves from one relevant idea, emphasis on relevant, to another relevant idea, completely, completely throughout the paper until the paper ends. Okay. Now, that's a pretty high standard. Um, every, that means that everything in your paper has to appear related. It, it means that when the reader encounters a, a new idea or a new piece of information, the reader immediately knows how that fits together with everything else that they've read in the sentence, in the paper. Uh, if I could sum it up, and, and this is, you know, this really is a high standard. It means that Every sentence and every paragraph, and every paragraph in that paper has a main point and a dedicated purpose. And here's the kicker. That is immediately apparent, not to you, but to the reader. Okay, the biggest problem that I've encountered in problematic papers, and, and I've encountered a lot of problematic papers, is a 
lack of consistent and relentless focus. You know, questions and confusion arise in the reader's mind either because they can't decipher the text or they can't understand why that idea is relevant to everything else that they have just read. Um, the paper contains what I call uh, non-communication zones. The writer and the reader are not on the same page. Now, relentless is, is a very important word here because it, um, a lack of focus can occur anywhere in the paper. It can occur, it can occur as part of a sentence, it can be an entire sentence, it can be an entire paragraph, it, it can even be multiple paragraphs. So sometimes you will write something, and, and I see this frequently, and you know, you can sort of tell that the idea is relevant, but the writer hasn't made it relevant to the reader. You want to make it apparent that the reader automatically sees how it fits in. If you turn to example one in the handout, hope you all got a handout. All right, this was a um, this was a graduate student paper. Oh, by the way, all of the examples that I'm going to show with you today, share with you today, I mean, these aren't make believe examples. These are these are real examples that real students have written. Now, you know, I, I put the paper's bottom line up there at the top so you can get a sense of how these two paragraphs fit in. And I was humming along through this paper, and I was okay with the first paragraph. And then I got to the second paragraph, and I, I had to stop and think, you know, what is this, what is this paragraph telling me as it relates to the core message of the paper? There was a lot of particular details, but you know, the reader is kind of leaving it up to me and other readers to figure it out. So if you look below the dashed lines there, you'll see what I would have substituted as a topic sentence for that particular paragraph that would have given that paragraph relevant relevance to the entire theme. <coughs> well, you know, that took a fair amount of time on my part to come up with that, because I had to look at it, ponder it, so on and so forth. You know, you don't want to put the reader in, in that position. So how does the paper lose focus? Uh, you know, you'll have, you'll have material in there that just doesn't belong. The paper strays into topics and details that um, don't really fit in with the main message. And this is an easy trap to fall into. Because what often happens, and if you look at the end of that second paragraph, it's sort of beginning to happen a little bit there. Uh, what will happen is a reader will provide information to elaborate on an idea that's already in the paper. And then they'll add additional information to the information that was added to give that information more context. And if you do that one or two more times, by that point, you're at, you're at a place that's pretty far removed what the uh, central theme of the paper should be. So if you look at that example in that second, in that second paragraph, you know, this is starting to look like a treatise on an individual as opposed to you know, the group's ability to conduct attacks outside of Somalia. Okay, missing ideas and information. You know, one of the things you really want to keep in mind is that your paper is essentially an argument. And when you have, you know, important blocks of that argument that are missing, not only do you lose the reader, but the credibility of your argument is going to weaken. And then lastly, the third way to lose focus is, you know, you have poorly placed ideas and information. You know, you have ideas that are relevant to the central theme, but they're not in the best place to, su to support a specific aspect that needs to be supported with that information at that place in the paper. 
Now, if you look at example three, and, and I'll give you a second to read paragraph three, which I, which I believe is on page four. I have I, italicized some information in that paragraph that at least to me seems to go off on a tangent regarding that paragraph. So read the paragraph with that information in it, and then read that paragraph with that information deleted. And you can sort of see how it really just kind of got thrown into that paragraph and it doesn't belong. You know, part of the problem with that information that I wanted to delete in that paragraph was, paragraph was I really not wasn't sure what the heck was being said there. Because I sort of got the rest of the paragraph. The rest of the paragraph pretty much says that uh, this terrorist group, you know, likes to work with pirates for, you know, for a variety of reasons. It generates revenue, and it sort of describes the relationship as kind of being troubled. But, you know, they both got a vested interest in working together, and so that, that kind of occurs. But this whole idea of the terrorist group itself sort of you know, getting in, enmeshed uh, on its own in piracy. You know, that's kind of a foggy idea. And, and that's just an example of how you can read the, uh, you know, you can confuse the reader. In the end, what I sort of con concluded, and I didn't have an opportunity to talk to the reader about, I mean, to the writer about. And, and you know, that's another point I want to make. You know, previously in my talk, I emphasize, you know, the importance of having, you know, you know, everything's got to be just right for the reader. And, you know, and there's a real simple reason why that has to be the case. And that's because 99 times out of 100, that writer is not sitting next to you when you're reading this article. And when you have a question, you can't say, um, you know, what did you mean here? Or what are you trying to say? All that reader's got is the paper, and that paper has to stand on its own. Well, in the end, what I sort of took away from that, and I say sort of took away because I didn't have a person there to, uh, to ask whether this was a correct interpretation or not. You know, and that's another point. You, know, you don't want to have, you don't want to have the reader doing the analysis on their own. You know, you start, you know, you've got to, you know, it's your responsibility to make those points you know, crystal clear. What I thought they could have been saying was that if this relationship with the pirates really went south, maybe the terrorist group itself would begin to engage in uh, piracy operations and sort of cut out the middlemen. And that would pose some terrorist advantages to the group, and that might be a rationale for them to move uh, in that direction. So, here's where I, I hope it gets a little fun. Uh, how to review your paper. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest three strategies. And they're all going to seem, and I, I deliberately made them uh, a little funny because I wanted them to be entertaining. But, but believe me, they're, they're de there's some really dead serious aspects <coughs> Underlying, underlying these uh, three strategies. Okay, first thing is I think you have to have an attitude back to paper. Now, when I mentioned before that when I was reviewing a paper and I would point out that you know, something's not quite right here, I would get pushback, right? Well, and, and I don't mean to be flip, flippant here, but attitude is not kumbaya and hugs and kisses with your paper. Okay. Uh, my paper is great, it's not an attitude. What you need to do is you need to step back, and I mean, and I mean I'm going to use this term uh, in all seriousness, you need to challenge the entire paper. You need to challenge every word, every sentence, and every paragraph. <coughs> from the perspective of one clarity and two relevance.
Okay, the second strategy is you need to talk to yourself. And, you know, when you don't have an attitude, you're just singing praises about the paper. Now this, and when, you, when I mean talk to yourself, you really want to have a frank conversation with yourself about the paper. Um, many times when writers proofread their paper, you know, it, it struck me that most of what they're doing is just kind of reading it and skimming it. And they're, try, and they're trying to get a sense of whether there's anything wrong or whether it sounds good. But there's not a lot of real rigorous, systematic evaluation of the paper and how it's constructed. So I would suggest that instead of just reading your paper, you ask yourself a series of five related questions. The first question is what is your paper's core message? What is its bottom line? The most important step in solving any lack of focus problem is to have a very well-defined main message that binds the whole paper together. Uh, the more precise and specific that bottom line, the better off you are. Uh, answer the question about what your paper's core message is out loud to yourself. Uh, you, if there is a problem with the bottom line and the core message not being really focused or well-defined enough, it's a lot harder to hide that when you have to articulate it out loud, either to yourself or to someone, to someone, to someone else. Um, in the past, when I would be reviewing a paper that struck me as being disorganized and going off in different directions, you know, everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And I would sit down with the author. My first question all the time would be, what is the main message that you're trying to get across? And 99 times out of 100, the initial response from the student analyst would be silence. And then, there would be a long, rambling discourse. Okay. Now, that was obviously a red flag that something was, was not right with that paper. <coughs> if your answer to that question has an about in it, that is another red flag. Uh, it suggests the paper is not very focused and the main message is not very well defined. My paper <coughs> is about um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula during, you know, the first, their activities during the first six months of 2014. You know, I'm sorry, but that, that's not going to cut it, you know. You know, it, and so when you ask that question to yourself out loud, you know, pay attention to exactly what you're, what you're articulating. And if you feel like it's drifting into some kind of general discussion, of an issue, as opposed to having a hard line, focused, very specific message, you probably have a problem with that paper. And believe me, it's not, it's going to show throughout the whole paper. It's going to be really hard to hide. Um, second question for yourself has two parts. You know, what is the main idea in the next paragraph after the summary or the introductory paragraph and does it relate to the core message of the paper? This answer, and, and I find this to be a really good technique, it, 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 you know, has to be articulated out loud. And you need to do that for every paragraph in your paper. You know? What is the main point I am making in this paragraph? And does it relate to the paper's main message? Now, if you looked at 
the example that we just went over, you know, if that if I think there would have been a way of catching that text that I had italicized if the writer had asked himself that question. Um, again, when you ask and when you answer, when you ask yourself this question, there should be no abouts in the paper. You know, you know, this paragraph is about. Um, AQAP's activities in January of 2014. That's not going to cut it as well. Now, depending on the answer you get to those, that, that question that you're asking about that paragraph, I mean, there's, there's strong likelihood you may need to go back and refocus that paragraph and sharpen, sharpen you know, the main point that you want to make in that paragraph. Uh, the importance of a good topic sentence in the uh, in a paragraph that's really very very hard to um, overstress. Uh, a good topic sentence will do two things for you, and, and both of them are really important to the coherence of that paragraph and to what the reader is going to take away from the paragraph. The first thing it's going to do is going to identify the paragraph's relevance uh, to the main message of the paper. Why am I, what am I going to take away from this paragraph? Okay. And the second thing it's going to do is going to provide a basis for you to focus all the other sentences in the paragraph on that one main point that you're emphasizing in the topic sense. Um, if you look at example number two, in the end of, and again, uh, let, let me make sure I give you enough time to read that paragraph. Um, if I'm not giving you enough time. Uh, please raise your hand. And again, you know, these are not make-believe paragraphs. You know, these paragraphs were all written either by uh, students uh, at an undergraduate or graduate level. Now, that paragraph sort of has a topic sentence, but it's not a terribly good one for a couple of reasons. But the biggest problem is that it's very broad. Okay, and it's. Um, you know, the idea that we first must gather a better understanding of the threat we face, you know, I mean, that's sort of a judgment, and, and, and I can accept that. I'm not sure it's worded as well as it could have been. But, you know, the threat from um, cyber hacking is pretty broad. And when you have a very broad topic sentence like that, you know, you're going to end up with a paragraph that, that kind of looks like that. And again, you're putting, you're putting the onus of what am I going to take away from this paper on the reader? And um, you know, I don't know about you, but you know, reading, <coughs> it can be, reading can be fun when it's clear. And when it's not clear, it's pretty damn taxing. You know, it's like doing a crossword puzzle. And, and, you know, no one likes to be stuck reading something that is going to take them a whole amount of energy and reflection when they've got a lot of other things to do besides try to figure out what this confusing paper is telling them or what the main takeaways of that paper should be. Now, again, I put myself in the role of the writer, but I, I didn't have the writer there to ask them, is this exactly what you were trying to say? So if you flip the page in the handout, I, I tried to break that paragraph up, which was kind of massive, into two separate paragraphs. One focusing on the economic aspects of cyber hacking, and then the second focusing on the military security aspects of cyber hacking. 
And I, those are, that writing, those topic sentences are in italics there, are, uh, that's what I wrote. And you can, you know, I'm not sure they're the best topic sentences in the world, but I sort of structured it so that I think the reader understands. You know, you, sometimes you have to hit the reader over the head. You know, the kind of writing that you'll be doing is not the mystery novel, novel kind, where, you know, the reader will read, you know, 25 pages, and then on the last page, you know, you're gonna, it will all become crystal clear. That's not going to work. You know, you want to give it to them in bits and pieces that they can accept and build on as they're going through that paper. And the only way to do that is to have your analytic judgments in, uh, for each paragraph up front and as clear as you can. Okay. Third question for yourself. Remember, we're still talking to ourselves. And we're still going through this paper line by line. The third question for yourself is, does the main idea you just articulated for that paragraph follow logically from the main idea you articulated for the previous paragraph? In other words, is that paragraph in the right place? Everything in that paragraph, all the other sentences, are they relevant to that main idea that you articulated for the paragraph under review? Or is there some material that kind of gives you the impression it just doesn't fit? Now, if it doesn't just fit, it may be because it just doesn't fit it needs to go. But it may be that you need to elaborate on that information that is striking you as not quite fitting so that it becomes more apparent to the reader what the role of that idea and information, how it fits in a little bit better. Okay. And then the fifth question well, and related to that question, fourth question about is everything in that paragraph relevant to the paragraph's main point is that you know, what about the order of the information? Does the order of the information strike you as being effective from the reader's perspective? Or are there parts of that argument, pieces of information that you think you need to sort of rejigger a little bit so that it's going to come across to the reader in a much more effective way. Okay, question number five. Is there anything missing in that paragraph? So let me go over those questions again. First question, you know, what is the main message that I, ha that I am delivering with this paper? No abouts in, that, uh, in the answer to your question. And you ought to be able to do it in a couple sentences. If you have more than a couple sentences, it's another red flag. So first question, you know, if I'm sitting, we, what we like to say at the, in the agency was we, we had this thing called an elevator briefing. And it happens all the time. You know, you think you have 30 minutes to brief somebody and most of the time you're, you're briefing people who are just running around putting out fires. And what that means is you not, you're never going to get 30 minutes. And a lot of times you've got to, they may have two minutes. And a lot of times you're telling them what they need to know in the elevator as they're going down to their, their car. So 
there's, you know, you have to be able to articulate something in just a couple sentences that's really going to pack, you know, the punch of, of all your analysis <coughs> and they're going to have an overall construct for what the situation is. Okay, don't mean to digress, sorry. Question number two is, what is the main point of the second paragraph does, and does it relate to the bottom line for the entire paper? And that question, the rest of these questions get asked of, of, every, of every paragraph in the paper. Third question is, does the main, you know, is the paragraph in the right place? You know, does that main idea flow logically from the paragraph in front of it? Then the fourth question is, you know, the rest of the paragraph and all the other sentences. You know, are, are they serving a, a role in that paragraph that's clearly apparent what you're trying to get accomplished um, in that paragraph? And then you know, the fifth question, if I haven't lost count. Some date earlier as I'm getting older and starting to lose my memory. Uh, is you know, is anything missing? You know, is there something and you read that paragraph that, that tells you? And, and if you're reading your paragraphs and if you're reading your material with a lot of focus, alarm bells should be going off. And so you know, you'll know, or you should know, if something is missing or not. Okay, now here's the third strategy for reviewing your paper. And Professor Hoffman actually paid me to put that one out there. And uh, give up your spring break. So what do I mean by give up your spring break? Um, usually, um, you'll spend almost as much time reviewing your paper and going over it and improving it as you spent writing that first draft in the first place. You know, and, and if you're obsessive compulsive disorder, like I could be sometimes, you may spend more time going over it because it, it can be an almost endless cycle. Don't do that. But spend a lot of time going over it. Um, Every first draft usually needs uh, a lot of work. And that's probably true regardless of who wrote it and how good a writer they are. So I would say, you know, as just sort of a general, general rule to keep in mind, you should be spending almost as much time reviewing your paper as you did writing that first draft. What that means in practical terms, and again, this is Professor Hoffman paid me to say this too, <laughs> and that is that if you have a paper that's due on Wednesday, you want to have that first draft completed well before Wednesday to give yourself ample opportunity to do the adequate review that every paper, mine included, almost always needs. And when you're writing that first draft, there is no way, there's no way you can think of everything uh, in terms of writing presentation as, as you're putting that draft down <coughs> on the keyboard because there is a lot of things going on in your head besides writing. And it's not until you step back and you look at what you've written and then you say, oh my God, you know, that, uh, you know that's not going to work there and it needs to be moved. All right, I think that concludes, Professor Hoffman, the, the paid promos. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of this is on me. Um, okay. Okay, I just want to talk a little bit about some big red flags when we're reviewing the paper. First one is, you know, paragraph lacks a precise and complete topic sentence that captures the main point. Okay. 
a paragraph's topic sentence, most of the time, is going to be some kind of analytic judgment or conclusion, or it could be some summary of a set of facts, like, you know, over the past six months, Country X has um, implemented, you know, half a dozen different measures to uh, curb inflation. Okay, that's what I mean by it doesn't always have to be, and typically in the beginning of your paper, as you sort of laying the foundation for the analysis or your message, you know, you're going to start with facts. That said, almost always a single fact is not going to work as a topic sentence without some kind of significance, meaning analysis, attached to it. A topic sentence that read, you know, in June of 2014, um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Peninsula conducted um, two attacks outside of um, Somalia or Yemen. You know, and, and that's kind of nice, but I'm not really sure what I'm going to do with that, you know. You know and so I think, you know, be leery, and this is a gray area, of course, right? But I would be real leery of building an entire paragraph around, um, you know, a fact, especially a single fact. And if you, if you remember that one example we looked at about the um, terrorist group Al-Shabaab and their ability to conduct terrorist operations outside of uh, Somalia, you know, that second paragraph is pretty much almost all factual about this one woman and conducting surveillance of this one mall. And, and it went to that fact to another fact about who she was married to. And, and then it went from that fact to, you know, her husband's terrorist activities. And hey, this paper is about Al-Shabaab, you know, not her husband or her kids or, 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 or anything else like that. Uh, that kind of information, you know, needs to be put in what I like to call text boxes or something like that. Now, regarding to this point right here is that think of each paragraph as a standalone story. Okay. Now you can use that to your advantage. Okay. One way to review your paper after you've gone through it systematically from the first word to the last word is to randomly select paragraphs from your paper and read them. Are those paragraphs telling a tightly focused, organized story that could stand by itself? And I would go back to the other example I talked about today where I was talking about cybersecurity. And if I gave you a paragraph that said, you know, cy cybersecurity has um, enormous economic ramifications and costs associated with it, and, and here they are. Well, that's a standalone story that's separate from the next paragraph, which is a standalone story on the military and strategic security ramifications of cybersecurity. Okay. A third way to use topic sentences as a way to proofread your paper is to just, and this is again after you've gone through every word in the paragraph, is to just read the topic sentences. And the question you want to ask yourself there is, you know, is there an obvious, emphasis on obvious, and logical line of march in the analysis if you just read the topic sentences. Okay, second big problem with a paragraph. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. Boy, when I encounter a long paragraph, which is good. I have to tell you, my first reaction is to recoil. I almost groan. And, and part of it is from experience, because I know no paragraph should be that long. 
and that I know it's a problematic, it's a problem paragraph. And I almost have to force myself to read it. Okay. Again, this is a gray area. You have to, you have to judge uh, for yourself um, whether the paragraph is too long or not. Now I go back to the example two on cybersecurity. And you know, this paragraph here, that size 11 font. I mean, it's very dense. Yeah. And, and when I talked, when I mentioned earlier that unless you're being very efficient and very transparent, you're really requiring a lot of the reader. You know, the reader is, is going to grow at when, it's, when he or she sees that paragraph. That's size 11 font, and it's two thirds of a. Uh, Two thirds of the page. I, I bet if I put that in 12 font, you know that paragraph is, is pushing a whole page. You know, a lot of times, you know, entire products may only be a whole page in three paragraphs, or, or two or three pages in six or seven paragraphs. So that that's definitely not going to work. And then the third red flag is, you know, you're you're reading the paper. And you seem to go on a, on a detour there. Um, but what often happens in this situation is the paragraph might start off with a little bit of focus. Where's my focus? And then it kind of will go into another area. And you know, and I don't know about you, but I, I'm, a, I'm a fairly critical reader, and I can sort of jump back. You know, I, I kind of shake a little bit, like, oh, I think, you know, someone's trying to put a fast, pull a fast one on me. And I get a little confused, and my forehead starts to sweat because I know this is going to be tough going. And then it will go back to that, to that um, idea that the paragraph started with. Well, the problem there is that you don't go all the way back. You've confused the reader. And you sort of undermine that paragraph a little bit by taking that detour. Because I'm not really sure now what the hell is being said here, excuse me, in that, in that paragraph. Because he threw what to me was curveball. Okay? So you put curveball anywhere in the middle of the paragraph, and, and you know, the reader is now pausing, and there's uncertainty in the reader's mind about what you were trying to convey. And that's not a good place for any writer to be, at least in our business or in the business that you're going to be. You don't want uncertainty in it. All right. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about individual sentences. Because, you know, that's the second part. But before I say that, you can go, I want to say you can go a long, long way with just good organization. You do not have to be Shakespeare and have this massive vocabulary in being able to write long sentences to get your point across. Organization will get you a long way towards the goal that you're trying to accomplish. But you do have to write sentences. And unfortunately, sometimes the sentences aren't clear enough you know, you've got a problem. So what, by way of guidance for improving your sentences, I'm going to leave you, I'm going to offer you uh, two approaches. One approach is a conceptual framework that I'd like you to keep in the back of your mind when you're reviewing your own writing. And then I'm going to uh, provide or offer up some specific guidance that's really derived from that conceptual framework. Well, first, the conceptual framework. Poorly written sentences almost always suffer from one of three generic problems. Too many words, or not enough words, the wrong words, in misplaced words. Now, related to that conceptual framework, it's important to remember that every word in the sentence that you're writing has a relationship with other words in the sentence. Now, 
But you want to ask yourself, are these words and those and that and those relationships among those words, are they as clear and coherent as possible? Regarding the idea that you're trying to get across. Are they the optimal words? And an emphasis on optimal. And you'll see, you know, this is again, you know, you can see this is not like let's draft this paper on Tuesday and turn it in on Wednesday, because that's not going to work. And, you know, when I mention optimal, that means, well, there might be a better word than the word you selected. And any time there's a better word, guess what? That may, that's just become easier for the reader to grasp what you are trying to say. Now, when these words and ideas don't quite mesh, the concept you are trying to get across, you know, it doesn't convey as well. The impact on the sentence, meaning how much is the reader going to have to struggle with this sentence, is going to vary. And by struggling, I mean struggle and then finally see the light of what the writer is trying to say, depending on how central those words are to the you know, main idea in the sentence. In some cases, you know, in this next example, Um, I didn't particularly like, and, and I understand this is a gray area, I mean, and I stumbled on it. So if I stumbled on it, and you know, I begin, I begin, uh, you know, the premise of my whole approach to writing it is that if the reader stumbles on something, then there's a problem. You know, I wasn't sure what a dedicated Roman Catholic was, and I'm Roman Catholic, uh, and and so, but. You know, I thought, well, devoted or religious, and I sort of get that idea across a little quicker. But I don't think in this particular case, this was necessarily a showstopper. And that's kind of what I mean by, you know, the words have to mesh, but depending on the role that those words are playing in the sentence, the impact can vary. In this case, it's not catastrophic. And you'll see how these are derived from that conceptual framework. Now, I wrote the book, and I gave a copy of the book to both Dave and Bruce. Analytic writing guide is largely about organization. And the second book I wrote, which they now have copies of, is about writing sentences. Now, I have, I have like 36 guidelines in there um, that are just broad general guidelines. And I tried to narrow them down to what I think are the three most important. And, and, and these are, this is my view on what the three most important guidelines are for sentence construction. You, know, you want to have, you want to build the sentence, and build is the right word, around, around a strong, direct verb that fits with the rest of the sentence. Because if the verb doesn't fit, with the rest of the sentence. You know, we had a problem with, I had a problem, excuse me, with dedicated Roman Catholic, right? Um, that's a disconnect, but it wasn't catastrophic. When you have a verb that doesn't fit, and I'm going to show you an example in a little bit, it becomes a catastrophic failure regarding that particular sentence. <coughs> okay. Second guideline. Be explicit. But it's sometimes difficult to say exactly what you mean. And, um, but you don't want to settle for close enough. Because when you settle for close enough, the reader then has to figure it out on their own and read between the lines. So be explicit. Be exact. Close enough. You know, close enough words, you know, Bruce and I are having a conversation and I'm not being very articulate and he could go, you know, geez, Lou, I didn't get that, what do you mean by that? You know, that can't, you don't have that opportunity again in your written products. And then the last one is eliminate verbiage. <laughs> now, I, verbiage, I'm trying to think of what the right term here is. Um, and it's, it's eluding me now, but you'll, you'll see the point I'm making. 
excess verbiage comes at a cost. And the cost is that it usually complicates the sentence. So it's not free, and it's not gratuitous. You, know, you just can't start tacking words onto the sentence and think, these are excess, excess words, and it's not going to have any impact on the readability of the sentence, because all the other words are there. And it won't do that. It'll complicate the sentence and make it harder for the reader uh, to process. So, you know, when you're reading your sentences, you want to ask yourself, you know, do you have, do you have words in that sentence that you don't really need? Or do you have words in that sentence that are just taking up space? Yeah. And I will offer you up something as, uh, as well. As you'll enjoy this because you'll get good at it. But you really have to say, okay, this is my goal, and I'm going to make this as concise as possible without losing meaning. And you'll, you'll find words to cut, and you'll go, boy, I really nailed that sentence. <laughs> but, so at least I do that with myself, and maybe I'm a little odd, so you know, I don't want to sort of transfer, you know. I believe me, I don't transfer my personality on yours. But, you know, you know, it's something that you can get quite good at relatively quickly if you're paying attention, and that's what your objective is. Okay, let me just discuss show you a couple examples. Okay, again, this here is in a showstopper, but it's not a very direct verb, you know, and I don't need experience day transition. Typically when you have an indirect verb, you're kind of diluting the concept that you're trying to get across. You know, you don't want to dilute anything, you know. You want to make it as direct and as hard-hitting as possible. Well, experience is just taking up space. I've got to process the experience, experience the transition. You know, I don't want to do that. Just tell me there was a transition. It went from A to B. That's all I want to know. <coughs> okay. When you're not explicit, the complete idea is not coming across. And I, you know, you might push back and say, okay, well, you know, read it twice, you'll get it. And that's all fine and dandy, except I've got a hundred sentences to read. So I don't really I don't really have the luxury of trying to figure out any single sentence. And I sort of know what they're talking about here. But you know, the idea is really not all that helpful to me. You know, providing provide an environment for terrorist links. Okay, let me stop reading and I'll figure that out. But that's not what I'm paying you to do. I'm paying you to write this so I don't have to do the thing. You know, that's why I'm reading what you wrote. So I, I rewrote this sentence, again, without help from the author, but I think this is what the writer intended to say. If you find stilted or funny language that is basically shorthand to be more explicit, you know, and, and that occurs a lot because it's really easy to go to some funky phrase, throw an adjective in front of something, and yeah, that works. Uh, you know, you might want to rethink whether you want to feel, elaborate a little bit. In this particular example, I stumbled when I read reparative initiatives. You know, it's not a phrase I hear a lot. And again, you know, I can sort of figure it out, but I, I don't want to put the reader in that position. And so I rewrote this sentence as providing you know, three simple words, and, and new initiatives to rebuild China. Okay, verbiage is one of my favorite topics. Um, clauses complicate a sentence a lot, because usually there's some kind of contrast associated or inconsistency in the idea that you're describing uh, when you use a clause like although. So unless you need to use a clause, okay, I wouldn't use a clause. I'd have the basic sentence structure, subject verb. 
And you'll see how much better this works. I didn't need that clock. You know, I didn't need to send the reader on a goose chase to make that clock. Here's another example. Here is a phrase. It doesn't really have a subject and a verb in it. So a long phrase like that, that's getting borderline whether it's too long, but I don't like phrases at the start of my sentences. I'd rather put them at the end once I establish some context for the reader to see the point. How I rewrote that sentence. In the wake of, it is evident. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you, you know. Don't beat around the bush. And here's here's kind of a favorite example of mine. It, you know, there's no long clause or no phrase here, but there's a couple ideas in there that I just don't think you needed to throw them in there. Into improved governance capacity. You know, it sounds like I'm reading a textbook. I hate reading textbooks. <laughs> and this sentence could have been simplified. I didn't need capacity there. I saved almost a line in that sentence. And I think I get the point across. You know, it hasn't improved governance. Governance still stinks. And it hasn't improved governance control. So again, the three things you want to pay most attention to when you're looking at your sentences. Strong and direct verbs. And you want to be explicit when you need to be explicit. And you want to eliminate verbiage when you can. All right, so that, that really concludes what I, what I you know, wanted to talk to you about today. Um, you know, in conclusion, I, I like to end up with this point. And I really believe this point because uh, Bruce mentioned that I started out as a mining engineer. And I did. And what that meant was uh, I could barely write a sentence when I graduated you know, from college. And I've gotten pretty good at writing sentences. So the point I want to make is that I'm fairly confident that if you want to improve your writing, you can. You know, writing, however, is a skill. And like every skill, it takes a lot of work. But once you learn how to do it, and this is the beauty of it, you know, it'll be there forever for you throughout your career, 20 years down the road. It's like riding a bike. So the more you develop that skill, the better it's going to get, and it's just going to help you a lot. Um, that, that's really about all I have to say. I want to thank you for coming today. I want to thank Bruce and Dave for having me, and uh, I hope it was helpful. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take a shot at I like the outline, but it doesn't have to be an outline. Um, it can be um, what I've seen sometimes called a concept paper, where you just you're putting an idea in the middle of a piece of paper and you're drawing a circle around it, and you're and you'll say, okay, what might that mean uh, for something that you're looking at? And you'll come up with another idea, and you'll draw you know a circle around it. It's called a concept map. I, I think you're sort of on the right path. The way I would begin any paper would be by putting ideas, not sentences, but generally ideas down on paper and seeing where those ideas go as I physically am looking at those papers and I'm asking myself questions about those papers. You might also want to have a discussion with someone, you know, okay? Because you'll just get a lot more brain activity either when you're, you're putting ideas down on paper and thinking about them, and when you're having a discussion. Yeah. Being able to look at something physically or to have a conversation with someone is where you really want to start as you lay out those ideas. Now, as you begin to work on the paper, and you actually as you begin to write it, other ideas will come. Did someone else have a question over here? You know, I just wasn't happy working in a coal mine in West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and for me, if I had stayed there, I would own half of West Virginia now because it was a very neat job. And people, they, they had very few mining engineers, and in five years, they were promoting them all to vice president. You buy a lot of real estate after that, you know, you own half of West Virginia. But it may not be much, but I would have taken it. And uh, I have done, as Bruce mentioned, I've done a lot of editing, a lot of reviewing. And I, one day I thought, well, let me see, you know, I know every time I'm moving something or changing something, I'm doing it for a reason. So the next time I do that move or change a word, I ask myself, what the heck was I doing? And I did that over and over and over again, and out came the book. Hmm. Yeah? Man, I think everything I said applies to anything you're going to write and send out, including emails. And I do that with my own, my own. I don't know about you, but I, I edit my own emails. I proof my own emails. Uh, and it does relate to other things as well. Presentations in particular. This particular presentation, truth be told, got a lot of massage. And, um, and I have to tell you, this is another thing. Go back to re-echo a point I made earlier about it's often not very good the first time you put it together. When I went through this presentation after I pushed together, I went, oh. And I cringed a little bit, you know. I, it, it's, it's true. Oh, what the hell was I thinking? I could talk about that then. You, know, you have the same experience when you're right. Sorry. You know, it depends on the point that all that information is supporting. Right. What I would what I would do is, you know, I don't want to give the reader too much information that all is supporting the same point. So I would go with my best information, my most current information, the information in that, you know, is linked best with whatever point I'm making. Now related to that, and what I've sort of seen happen sometimes is when people get a lot of information, they think they have one point. But they actually got they actually have multiple points. And what you want to do is comb and filter that information, looking for, you know, what are what are what are some different points I could make here that are really different. And and most of the time I think you'll come up with something. So what I would suggest is not just look for similarities in that information, but look for differences. And that'll give you a different point, or a slightly different point. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.